contribution to tonight is when you hear the words Tuturua Fiti Whakamaua Ka Tina, your response is Tina. Okay, so we're going to practice that so you know it. Tuturua Fiti Whakamaua Ka Tina. Tina. Okay, that sounds a pretty dead Tina there, so we want to up and live Tina. So we'll try it again. Tuturua Fiti Whakamaua Ka Tina. Tina. Yes, Tina is live and well, so yes. Uh, your next response after you hear the words homie who year is tai ki so we'll practice that homie who year very good okay let's, so let's start into this blessing and so yep go something like this tenayo tenayo ko te hokai nei taku tapu wai ko te hokai nuku ko te hokai rangi ko te hokai o to tupuna hata ne nui arangi i piki ti ai ki ngā rangi tu ha ha ki te tihi o manono I roko hinga tūra, ko iwa matua kore ana ke, i riru i hoana, nā kete o te wānanga, ko te kete tuauri, ko te kete tuatea, ko te kete aranui. Kā tiritiri a kā paupaua ki a papatua nuku, kā puta te i da tangata ki te whai ao, ki te ao mārama. Tūturu o whiti whakamaua ki a tīna, hau mea hui e. Reira, i ngā mana, i ngā reo, a rauranga tirama hara mai, a, ki tēnei whare kōrero, hei, hei whare whakaruru hau mā tātou i roto tēnei rangi. Hara mai ki tāmaki me kaura, tāmaki here ngā waka, tāmaki here ngā tangata. Reira, nau mai, hara mai, whakatau mai. Greetings to you all who have come this evening to this place, tāmaki me kaura. Tāmaki is a place that people long to be. Tāmaki, Heringa Waka. Tāmaki, the place where the waka gathered, the canoes gathered. Tāmaki, Heringa Tangata. The place, Tāmaki, the place where people gather. And again, we are gathered here to have some more conversation about our city. So without further ado, I will hand it over to our, the Mayor of our city, Phil Goff. No more my phone. Ah, inga mana, inga reo, yora ranga tera ma, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa. Tēnā te mihi nui ki a koutou. And welcome everybody to Auckland Conversations, where tonight we're looking at how we can future-proof our city and that means really sustainability. What we need to be doing in sustainability, are we doing enough? Are we doing the right things? Are we focused in the right area? Uh, we've got a star-studded panel in front of us tonight. Uh, so my comments will last about seven minutes, but I would like to acknowledge uh, Dr. Michelle Dickinson. I uh, couldn't think of a better person to MC this, Michelle. Um, I always hate it when you follow me speaking because you are so good at it. Um, can I also acknowledge from Australia, Davina Rooney. Welcome, Davina. Good to have you here. John Morrow, who's our, sustainability, uh, our Chief of Sustainability. Uh, Jacqueline Paul and Ludo Campbell-Reed, who is our design champion. You've just got to look across our city anywhere, and what will you see? Well, I haven't actually counted them, but I'm reliably informed that there are 98 cranes across our city's horizon. We've got something like $73 billion worth of commercial construction underway, and our city is growing. Within the next decade, we're going to hit two million people. And, you know, we need to look at both sides of what those things mean. Growth means, in a positive sense, that New Zealand gets the globally competitive and international city that it needs. It means that we're being enriched by the diversity uh, that we have in our city, and I want to celebrate that, particularly given the events uh, of nearly four weeks ago. We're also of a scale now where we offer choice and opportunity to people and how they learn, how they live, how they enjoy their leisure. We have the ability and we are creating an exciting and a vibrant city. Now there's the downside. If you grow rapidly, but you don't provide the infrastructure for the city, you end up with traffic congestion, you end up with a housing shortage 
and an unaffordability problem, and you end up putting huge pressure on your environment. We're trying to tackle all of those challenges, but tonight the discussion is going to focus on what we're doing for our environment, how we are sustaining it, how we can enhance and protect it, and whether we're doing enough. Yesterday, a survey came out from a Singapore-based website. It's called the Value Champion Survey. And it rated New Zealand, rather than specifically Auckland, against 13 other Asia-Pacific countries. Guess what? We topped the poll in air quality. We topped the poll in terms of green open space. And we topped the poll in terms of renewable energy. But look where we didn't do well. We absolutely bombed on transportation, and we bombed uh, in the area of waste. Those are two areas where we are not doing enough and need to do a whole lot more if we are to be regarded as an environmental, environmentally friendly city. I just want to touch, and it's really a bullet point a comment from me here tonight, on five areas where we need to future-proof. The first, and it has to be first, is climate change, because that actually threatens our survival, economic and environmental. I want to look at waste. We have a big problem in that area. I want to look at water quality, greening Auckland and predator control, all in the space of about two minutes. The first one in terms of climate change, uh, where do we begin? I think we have to begin with transport. That's 40% of our carbon emissions. And what we need in our city is a change of culture. And that's pretty fundamental in two areas. One, in how we move around our city, and two, how we live, because we have to do both things. How we live is about a more compact city, greater intensification, uh, not building more and more suburbs further and further out from the city, uh, and bigger and bigger motorways to service it. We've got to change from the culture of the private car. Uh, I live in the countryside, I confess, and I, that's the only way I can get to work. But when I drive down the motorway, every car I see, almost every car in the morning, commuter traffic, single occupant car. We need a better public transport system. We all know about the city rail link. You'll hear more about that next week and what it's costing. Uh, but what we've got to know is what it's delivering, and what it will deliver is doubling our rail capacity, a more effective and efficient and environmentally friendly way of travelling its electric. We've got a bus fleet that's doing really well. Bus numbers are skyrocketing, but it's diesel. I signed the fossil fuel-free fossil fuel streets declaration in Paris at the C40 conference about 18 months ago, and we are committed to converting our bus fleet. We also need to focus on walk and cycleways. And guess what? As we intensify the way we live, we've got 57,000 people now living here in the city centre. Two decades ago, it was about 3,000. But what we've got to do in making the adjustment to that is pedestrianise. Queen Street should be pedestrianised. High Street, Federal Street. Let's turn Victoria Street into a linear parkway, which is something dear to the heart of Ludo campbell Reed. We need to ensure that people can cycle around our city, and I should acknowledge Pippa Coombe, who's here somewhere, that cycles everywhere, the chair of the Wairamata local board. Uh, we need to look at active forms of transportation. I hope I led the way on that. I got rid of the SUV uh, that, the, that was provided to the former mayor that was chauffeur-driven and replaced it with a self-drive 100% electric car. But guess what? For every electric car we're importing into New Zealand at the moment, we're importing 65 diesel SUVs. They will be on our roads for 20 years. And my message to government is you've got to actually incentivise the importation of electric cars now, because in 20 years' time, we can't afford to have those vehicles still on the street. Secondly, I wanted to talk about waste. You've probably heard of the China's national sword policy, where they suddenly decided they wouldn't accept all of the waste that we were sending to them, and they created a, a crisis in our ability to deal with our waste and to get recycling done. We currently send to Indonesia and Malaysia. They'll close too. 
We don't have the ability to recycle our waste onshore, particularly paper and cardboard and plastics, and we need that. That's a discussion that we are having at the moment with the government. We need to reduce the actual supply of waste. Our packaging industry is a disgrace. We create more plastic than almost any other developed country, and we have to change our ways there. We need to substitute with biodegradable products. We need product stewardship and a container deposit scheme, so we create the incentive for people to recycle, and we're having those discussions with government as well. Third is water quality. You know, we introduced about 18 months ago a program called Safe Swim, and it gives for the first time ever in New Zealand real life data on the quality of our water. And when you look up the, the app on your phone after it's rained, you'll be appalled to know that there are 60 popular beaches around Auckland that aren't safe to swim in. We've made the decision to bring forward the plans to stop our stormwater going into our wastewater and clean up our beaches and our waterways and we will reduce wastewater by 90%, wastewater overflows by 90% within a decade. And thank you Aucklanders, because you voted for the water quality uh, in, uh, targeted rate. And when we asked Aucklanders, are you prepared to pay to clean up your beaches, by three to one, they said yes. And I congratulate you on that. That gave us the green light. Fourthly, greening Auckland. Um, there's a program that I initiated called the Million Trees Program. Not quite as ambitious as the, as the government's Billion Trees Program, but the difference is I'll achieve my target. Um, <laughs> my apologies to my former colleagues. Um, we, will, we will achieve that uh, within two months. We will have planted our million trees, but what's more, we actually do need to do more to protect our, our trees. I think it's appalling that a 400-year-old kauri tree has been cleared by the Environment Court to be felled in Titarangi. We don't have the protection because they changed the Remote Resource Management Act to take it away, and I'm in correspondence with the Minister for the Environment to bring back a scheme for better protection of our, our heritage and our spectacular trees. The only other thing I'd mention about trees is kauri dieback. Um, I was appalled, and you would have been appalled to see that the growth in kauri dieback disease was from about 9% to 18% over a five-year period, and kauri trees risk exti extinction. We have increased the budget to combat that from 3 million over the long-term plan to 100 million. We're showing our commitment there. And the final thing I want to mention is predator control. Um, I don't know how many of you have been out to Turituri Matangi, but if you want to see what Auckland once looked like and the bird life, go out there and it's amazing. It's been replanted and the native bird life there is prolific. We are doing that now with all of our Gulf Islands, including Waiheke, the first urban island in the world that we will make predator free. And out where I live in the Hunuas, um, back 20 years we had one last remaining breeding pair of kokako. We have now increased that to 106, and I know not everybody in the audience will be in favour of 1080, but I've got to tell you this, after the poison drop last year, we were kept before we were catching 75 rats for every 100 traps, now we are catching none. They have been eliminated, they will gradually come back. We've eliminated the stoats and we've wiped out the opossums. And I think that's great for Auckland. And part of future-proofing and sustainability is that hopefully in our lifetime, or if not in our lifetime, for our kids and our grandkids, we will see the sort of thing that our forebears saw 80, 90, 100 years ago in terms of our bird life and the the resumption of the growth of our native forests. So good news, challenges. Tonight, you have the chance to hear uh, four great speakers on that topic. I hope the evening for you is informative and enjoyable. Nō reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tato katoa. Thank you very much.
Welcome everybody to this amazing space. Thank you, Phil. That is exactly what we needed to get us started here. Five amazing points to get us thinking. Um, kia ora everybody, my name is Dr. Michelle Dickinson and I'm gonna be your guide this evening as we go through our Auckland conversations. Tonight we're gonna have a great keynote address and then a fun set of panelists who hopefully are gonna get some confrontation going because I think we need to have some big discussions in Auckland. Um, and thank you so much for coming. This is an amazing turnout. Turn around, look, this place is packed. And do you know why I love it when it's packed? It's because we actually care about our city. You didn't all go home after work to sit and watch TV. You came here because you're passionate about your city. And I'm passionate about our city, and I'm really excited to talk to you all today. Also, hello to everybody who's on our live stream. For those of you who aren't in the room, you're sitting at home, you're those guys watching this. We're um, excited to have you here today. And um, for those of you who want to join us, tweet to your friends. We're on Auckland Conversations website. You can live stream in if you couldn't make it tonight. For those of you who are here in the room, a couple of housekeeping rules. In the um, unlikely event of an emergency, the alarm will sound and very calm people will point you in the direction that we're supposed to go. Follow those people. Um, bathrooms, if you need them, are loca located just outside the ballroom entrance. And if I could ask you to all kindly put your phones to silent. Don't worry about turning them off. Take some photos. Tweet away. If you would like to tweet tonight, we are on the hashtag AKLConversations. So let all your friends know what you are missing by tweeting up a storm. We would really like to thank New Zealand Green Building Council who have partnered with us for this event tonight. And also thanks to our Auckland partner who are South Face Construction and our design partner who are Resine. Also a huge thanks to all of our program supporters. So we're gonna do two things today, a little bit of high tech and a little bit of low tech in our format for our panelists. This is all about you, so we will have panel members being able to answer all of your questions. The high tech version is to use something called Slido, S-L-I-D-O. If you go to slido.com, if you have a smart device here, if you're at home and you wanna log on, slido.com and enter the event code hashtag future, that is how you get into asking questions online. So if you're too afraid to put your hand up or if you're far away, do that. It will go to my iPad here and I'll be able to ask questions to the panelists for you. If you like old school, we have the old fashioned method of putting your hand up. That's gonna work too. So if you put your hand up and I will try and see you, there will be roving microphones around so I'll try and get to as many questions as possible. Um, we also always try to ensure that Auckland Conversation events are inclusive and accessible. So our on-demand viewing of the event, plus a full transcript with captioning of the event and presentations will be available on the Auckland Conversations website in the next couple of days. So why are we all here? Let's just set the scene. We know that Auckland's population right now is around 1.6 million. Now, some people say it may grow to 2 million by as early as 2029, but actually some people are predicting that we may double our population over the next 20 to 30 years. And with that growing demand, we know there's gonna be growing demands on housing, on infrastructure. We know that the climate is changing and that's gonna expose our city to lots of impending disasters, perhaps, natural disasters. What on earth is gonna to happen to our city in the event of a natural disaster? So future-proofing our city has become more important than ever. The way that we plan our city, design, construct, and govern our city will determine our future viability. And the world cities are under threat from many different things. But the question is, is building a sustainable city actually an integral part of Auckland's future? And if so, can we actually do it? What will it look like? Is it possible? Tonight, Auckland Conversation is to engage that question with you, our panelists, and our speakers. And I'm so excited to have this conversation with you today. But first, I would like to invite to the stage our keynote speaker for tonight. Davina Rooney um, is the General Manager of Sustainability and Corporate Procurement at Stockland. She is a property professional with a broad range of sustainability experience from environmental profit uh, sorry, from environmental projects, not-for-profit boards, and overseas community development work. She's about to commence as the Chief Executive Officer of the Green Building Council of Australia, and she has built a reputation as a deeply insightful and collaborative leader. She's also a fellow engineer, so I would like to invite Davina to the stage. <laughs>
thank you so much for having me. It's such a privilege to be here today and to join with Auckland as they have their conversation. I've had the, the key opportunity of being involved through my company and I'll give you a little bit of context of our journey in this space. And I come here to give you some of the information, some of the lessons we've had along the way so we can interpret those and discuss how they may be useful for yourself. So to give a little context, Stockland is the property group I work for. They're one of Australia's largest diversified property groups. What's fascinating about this is we build most of the key elements that make up a city. Uh, residential, retirement living, office developments, retail, industrial. And we've actually been considering the space that we're discussing tonight of how it impacts our cities. Um, our largest community that we're developing is a small city, 50,000 dwellings. And when we actually start considering things at that scale, how we plan for the future in climate resilience is pretty fundamental to us. So one of the questions when people talk to me about this is they sort of say, what's your perspective in this space? And who exactly is Stockland on the global sustainability scene? So to give you a little bit of context, um, we're currently on the Dow Jones Sustainability Index, the global property lead on the global real estate and environmental sustainability benchmark in our asset category, we are the global lead. And we're currently on Australia's, um, on the A-list for CDP, the Climate Disclosure Project. What does that mean? We've been spending a lot of time and work in this space for a decade, and there's a number of lessons in, in our journey that may be useful for consideration as Auckland takes on this very important conversation. Now I think one of the things when we think about is how do you take on long-term journeys, I think it's very fundamental that we put sustainability at the heart of that journey. So if you actually, I'll only touch on this briefly, but if you look at my organisation's business strategy up there, the white parts are our enduring business strategy of grow asset return and customer base, operational excellence and capital strength. Now the thing that I note is all of that strategy is enabled by sustainability progress. How do we actually work better with our customers? Well, that's always enabled by how we shape thriving communities. In every asset class, we have to fundamentally engage differently and work with our customers. So whenever we do residential developments, we actually do a long-term livability survey where we actually measure people's satisfaction with the key design elements, the community programming, and use that to inform our strategies in those areas. We're going to spend quite a lot of time tonight talking about how we optimise and innovate, which is really how we engage in making meaningful environmental change and considerations in the carbon space. Now, I think one of the things that business and government have to talk about well in this space is when we actually drive energy efficiency programs, they make fundamental business sense. You know, the company that I've had the privilege to work with has saved over $90 million in deferred bills and actually whilst turning off the equivalent of sort of half of our portfolio in office. And if we actually look at that, this combination of efficiency and efficacy is really what we're going to actually need to drive over a longer term journey. We also have to look at how this builds to capital strength. And just to briefly touch on that, how we deliver these elements in partnership together is of the most fundamental importance. And you know, so if we look at green financing instruments like the green bond, I'm happy to, green bonds, how we actually engage different parts of the sector in meaningful ways, that's very important. But when I talk about partners, when I look at my partners within Australia, I actually look at the key government partners that we work with. And one of the panelists before this was asking me, how do you work um, with your council area? What's your home council? And it was a great question because our home council is the city of Sydney, of which we were one of the founding members of the Better Buildings Partnership. And that city um, has a partnership where we all commit to hitting 70% by 2030 in our buildings and actually move together on that trajectory of measuring. We were part of their resilience partnership. And I think one of the key messages when we talk about the complex, difficult conversations we're working through tonight is how do you do it? Together is the answer. 
So I was asked a little to give some of my reflections on a long journey in this space to see if any of those lessons as we discuss them in the panel can help Auckland as they consider their journey. So for us, we've been on this journey for over a decade and I think it all started exactly where the Auckland conversations are really evolving at the moment. How do you establish meaningful frameworks? How do you set up ways of measuring? And then as, you know, so for us, it was really sad in our early days, it was about setting up the governance frameworks and the accountability metrics. As we moved a couple of years into our journey, it was all about how we set bigger targets and then held ourselves to account to achieving them. And then how we actually moved across deeply into everything we do. And I think that's really the phase um, that Auckland's in when they describe you know, the climate mapping work that you've been doing and some of your climate symposiums that you've been having over the last month. And I guess for us, as we sort of move through the different phases of our journey, it's been about trying to actually take some of those small ideas and make them bigger. You know, so for us, we started with uh, the smallest solar system you've ever seen. You know, we did that in 2011. We took that to a degree of scale, and we're currently running Australia's largest property solar rollout from one property group at this stage. Now, how you actually do that is exactly the same strategies that are being discussed here about take a meaningful piece that works, embed it in your governance, take it to scale and discuss it with your communities and then evolve these over time. But the subject to the conversation that we're focusing on tonight is really about how we start to make meaningful impacts about climate and then how do we actually consider the key variables that, that need to be discussed in these conversations. Now, whenever I actually think of starting these journeys, I think drawing down from some key international examples is really important. Sometimes people get confused when we talk about climate because they talk about metrics and targets. What are we actually going to do so that we stay within the Paris Agreement? And then how do we work on climate adaptation or what's the strategy and the governance? And I think we're really fortunate that there's some amazing global frameworks. There's a thing called the um, task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosures that effectively sets out a framework for implementation across these measures. And we're actually starting to see that encompassed around the globe at scale. Now, fascinatingly, this framework didn't come from the environmental movement. It actually came from the Financial Stability Board, a board that was set up globally to have global financial security after, um, you know, the financial events that we had about 10 years ago. And so I think the thing is the dialogue has changed where when we actually speak about climate resilience and there's a fundamental global understanding that if we're going to be future focused, you know, exactly as the reflections tonight, this is where we need to start. If we're going to have any prosperity, we need to be understanding this. And just to give you a little bit of context of where I come from, we're at the point where if you don't have strategies in this space, there's a national report on investing in the dark. Um, Australian companies still failing to disclose cl climate risks. And what this is fundamentally saying is if you're going to build prosperous cities and a prosperous economy, you need to have long-term planning in place to actually manage these issues. Now I've talked a lot about frameworks, but now I'm going to talk to you a little bit about our story. Now that is, um, and we're going to talk a little bit about this tonight, Auckland's just gone through a journey of mapping how much at risk your assets are. That's a map of ours from 2011 where we looked at how much at risk our assets were. And so tonight we're going to talk a little bit about how you actually start there and then move your assets along a different journey. Now how did we start? As it often is the case, we started with a crisis. We had one of um, our far north Queensland assets had a cyclone and very quickly one of our shopping centres became a disaster recovery facility with, you know, very limited notice and access. Now for us that was sort of the start of we really need to do more work with universities. We need to fundamentally understand how we keep what we do to make sure that these assets are in the best shape possible because when you have a disaster, the entire community becomes involved and public buildings become very engaged. We started to develop all of our disaster resilience planning, all of our key relationships across our cities to do an engagement 
but one thing that was clear to us was we couldn't actually do this in one location. So we took of all a map of our country, of our portfolio, looked at the latest climate research and then mapped how vulnerable our assets were. And then we did our first stage of setting a three-year plan of where our assets are, I don't want them to be that vulnerable in three years, and started doing physical mapping of each location of what would it take to start to make change, and then deployed that through long-term discussions with our insurers. Now, the thing I can tell you is when we discuss this across our economy and with our insurers, our buildings are actually easier to insure and we get a lot of engagement. This is this form of planning that you're talking about the thing that I would say to you is, it's difficult, but it's absolutely possible. And you know, we achieved our target of moving those buildings' resilience to a lower point of vulnerability. Now, the next point that I'll make is, everyone loves talking about climate resilience, but the reality is, when we have a big disaster, it's actually about the community. So we, a few years later, after we'd been doing some of this framework work, we had a the Cyclone Marsha at a place called Stockland, Rockhampton. And we've been doing quite a lot of work. We kept having um, the, we had a creek below um, the entrance to our asset. It kept getting washed away to current design standards. We designed to far higher standards and then we actually um, had no issues at our asset, but we were the only asset functioning in the region. So we were the only ones with power. And so all of a sudden, we had field hospitals in our shopping centre car park. We were the local telecommunications area. And so our focus shifted from just being about climate resilience to community resilience. Because the reality is, when these transformational events happen, it's actually the community that is most impacted. And so going back to some work with my home council, the city of Sydney, they've been um, involved in the C40 climate resilient cities, but what's been really interesting about their approach is they've started mapping not just climate vulnerabilities, but they've actually been mapping their entire community's vulnerability. Because they're saying the points of climate resilience will actually be at some of the points of the highest community resilience. Now I'm just very briefly going to, now what does that mean? That means we actually have to start looking at, yes, the physical assets of an individual asset, but what does that fundamentally mean across our economy and what does that mean to our supply chain and actually start mapping those things because you know, if we're going to have the scale of change that we're describing, we have to be able to help all the parts of our society move. It's going to be different education programs, different support, different transport systems. And so the thing that we can't forget and I think was sort of eloquently described earlier is that there's opportunities in this. When we actually look at the large-scale transport planning that was referenced and we look at electrification of your, of your transport systems, that's only going to work if we've decarbonised the building sectors and made them a lot more efficient. Otherwise, where's the power going to come from without fundamental structural shifts? Or where are the key opportunities in the renewable sector? We've got to work through these complex issues while selling a message of hope to our communities. And the thing that I would sort of, that gives me the most hope is when I look at the complexity in these challenges, for all the challenges we have, there's these beacons of light um, on the horizon. When I have the privilege um, to work with the New Zealand Green Building Council, and I get to see some of the amazing programs that they're doing in the home space, which is sorely needed, or the fact that there's frameworks that are being launched that cities are signing up to where they commit to net zero by 2030 and you can sign off property portfolios. The thing is we can't become so challenged by the things we're describing that we don't do today the things that we know need to happen. And so my final challenge point as we go um, into this discussion is at this, we're starting to see around the world rallies of children asking what action we, the grown-ups in the room, are taking on climate resilience, on the climate. There is no planet B. Now, at the moment, we know that we, you know, we don't have a lot of children in this audience suite. We haven't had them demanding more renewables and better buildings. And so we know that when we do these conversations, we actually have to take all the frameworks and the great concepts and plans that we're deciding and that Auckland's deciding and make that far more of a community conversation. 
So I'm absolutely thrilled to be here today to be the first panellist to just start to discuss this community conversation and I really commend Auckland for not just going to technical frameworks with boring engineers like me but actually to turn this into a community conversation where you reimagine how you design your cities for the future. Thank you. I look forward to having a discussion with you on this fabulous subject. Thank you, Davina. So climate resilience. Now I'm going to invite our next panelists up to the stage, please. So please, can I welcome John Moreau, who is the Chief Sustainability Officer at Auckland Council, Jacqueline Paul, who is a lecturer at the School of Architecture at Unitech Institute of Czech Technology, and Ludo Campbell-Reed, General Manager of Auckland Council's Auckland Design Office. So here are our panelists. For those of you at home who are asking um, slido.com, the hashtag is um, hashtag future. Um, and those of you in the room who would like to do that too, that goes straight to this iPad here. So I will start taking some questions. Please be ready. But before we do, um, I know there are three strange people on the stage who haven't really got anything, um, any knowledge about yet. So what I'm going to do is kindly ask if our panelists can sort of sum up who they are and what they do in a very, very short sentence. Ludo, if I can start with you, please. Yeah. My, oh, there we go. Uh, kia ora, everybody. Uh, Michelle, thank you. Um, look, my name is Ludo Campbell-Reed. I'm the council's design champion. I'm uh, responsible for um, uh, the Auckland Design Office, which is a team of 64 of uh, Auckland Council's finest um, looking to drive urban design into the, the heart of our decision-making at the council. Uh, I've been here 13 years, and it's probably the, the best job in the world. Uh, so kia ora, I'm Jackie. I'm, yeah, as mentioned, a, a lecturer at the School of Architecture at Unitech um, and then over at AUT uh, working with the National Science Challenge on building better homes, towns and cities and currently on the Auckland Youth Advisory Panel for Auckland Council. Kia ora. Kia ora, koutou. Oh, man. No. <laughs> hey, look at that. Kia Help with the front. Kia ora koto, ko John Moro Tako Ngoa, ko Tako Toronga, te Chief Sustainability Officer. Aho, I run the Chief Sustainability Office of Auckland Council, um, which I will uh, point out is sitting somewhere in the back there. There are some fabulous members of my team who would be happy to answer your questions because most of what I will talk about is about their collective brilliance. Perfect. All right, that's Thanks. a summary, and we're getting some questions coming in. Um, in fact, lots of questions, but I'd like, I'd like to actually start, um, I'd like to start with Jacqueline, if, if that's okay. Um, look, I'm really passionate about young people, and, and we don't have, no offense, but we don't have that many young people in the room today. And by young people, I'm talking about, you know, our, our next generation of children. Don't be offended by that. I'm not saying you're all old. I'm just saying that, that I work a lot with high school um, and primary school children who are passionate about the climate, who are passionate about their homes and their communities, and we don't often get to hear their voice. So Jacqueline, can I ask you, um, how do you think our young people contribute to our cities? Um, and what impact do you think they should have in, in these conversations? Cool. Oh, kia ora. So hands up if you're under 25. No, hands up if you're really under 25. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, you know, in Auckland we have such a high population of young people and yet we're not really involved in these types of conversations. Um, but like Davina's already said, you know, they're out, they're out there, they're, you know, activists in the own in terms of, you know, school strike for climate, uh, those, those tamariki and rangatahi out at Uhumatau. So they're out there, they're contributing to, you know, real grassroots um, korero, but it's still grassroots level. How do we kind of think about how we connect those uh, communities so that we're, we're developing more of a partnership and they're having a voice at the decision making table. You know, I'm only lucky because I sit on one of um, the Auckland advisory panels. Um, and so there, there's 21 of us on that board uh, and we're able to have a say and, you know, act as, I guess, a robust system of accountability to, <laughs> to really understand, you know, what council is doing to, uh, I guess, you know, empower rangatahi, invest in things that really affect their future. But there's still a huge disconnect because people are still making decisions that are influencing our futures for our young people, but we're not included. So how do we start shifting those conversations? I love that. Thank you so much. Um, John, I have a question for you. Yes, keep it around. Um, John, um, look, I've just come back from travelling um, 
I've just been three weeks in China and a week in Europe, and it's fascinating to just be in another city and sort of see what's going on. I love Auckland. It's my home. I'm passionate about Auckland. But we have some challenges here. So, I mean, talking about young people is, is one factor, but actually we have a range of organizations and invested parties who sometimes challenge what we want to do and slow things down a little bit. Um, so how do you see us working together um, for big topics like climate change when there are so many different invested parties who maybe have different opinions? I mean, that's an interesting question because I think everything's on track and nothing's wrong. So it would be, no, just kidding. Um, <laughs> so, so look, um, that's, that's important because I would also challenge everybody in this room um, that, you know, we're all part of the problem and all part of the solution, depending on where you sit. Um, and it's, I think Michelle said it really well. You're here tonight engaging Cordero with us to figure out how we future-proof our city. And that's a really big step forward. So from my perspective, at least I could talk from what my team and I are doing around climate change with probably a lot of you in the audience as well. Um, I think there's, um, you know, there's something, I think we might hear a bit about some ingredients um, from, from my colleague Ludo, um, and I'm very curious, because he has unveiled only that they're ingredients, and I don't know what they are yet, so I'm nervous. Um, but I, maybe I'll talk about the recipe, and I'll talk about that getting that right in collaboration and doing things quite dramatically differently is really required. Um, I think there's nothing like climate change um, to generate a need to do something quite radical in changing how we do things. So just a couple quick examples. As we're currently with some of you in the room, and hopefully all of you by the time you leave, um, developing an integrated, inclusive, um, and intergenerational climate plan for the region. How are we going to address these issues? We're doing that right now. And in doing so, we're doing things differently. You know, of course, we're council. We don't always go completely radical. But we're, we're thinking of new partnerships. How do we engage with Montefenua really engage in partnership with Montefenua. I will say we don't have that perfectly right, but boy, we're trying really hard. How do we engage with the private sector as a member of the Climate Leaders Coalition and actually as a large business in Auckland? We're doing things differently. We've signed up to some pretty ambitious goals and targets of how we're going to do that. Um, how do we use our platforms and, and you know engagements like this, but also online platforms like Climate AKL to actually generate a discussion around these issues and pull that feedback into the design of the plan? And then, like you mentioned earlier on, Davina, thank you, about the climate symposium we held also in partnership um, with some of my colleagues on the panel. Um, how do we actually you know, think of when we're having a climate symposium, it's not just about um, perhaps people like Ludo and I and what we rep represent. It's actually about a diversity of opinion, and it's about engaging in a different way about issues that are climate related, but they're actually also related to intergenerational equity, a just transition, Rangatari uh, Maori uh, and Pacifica, and starting a whole new integrated set of conversations that, frankly, they're challenging. They, they really challenge us to integrate some stuff that's really difficult for us to do so. So I guess what I'm trying to say is the, the how is probably almost as important as the what. We kind of know what. We can look around the world. We could look to mighty Sydney and know what we need to do. But the how is actually where we win. Thank you, Joan. And, and I like that you set us up for Kororo. So um, there are going to be microphones around. So if you do have a question, get ready to put your hand up. While you're preparing to put your hand up, I'll take one from Slido right now. This is from Nick, Nick with a C. Um, Nick wants to know, how do we stop building roads and start building transport systems? Who would like that one? Start small, hey. Ludo. Shall I give it, shall I give it a go? Look, I, I think um, it's a great question and it goes to the heart of, of the whole conversation today. Um, you know, Greta Thornburg and the team, you know, the young people who've been pushing the agenda, you know, the house is on fire is really what they're talking about. Uh, and the biggest emitter is, is the transportation. So hitting that conversation is really important. And so it's really understanding that, that these impacts that we're making today and, and I understand, I guess, looking at other cities around the world, if you think about cities that have, have been pushing the agenda, you know, Vancouver back in the 70s, you know, decided, made a, made a decision that they weren't going to build any more freeways in their city. You know, London built its underground when its population was only one million people. I mean, you know, Michelle, you've just come back from China. I mean, yesterday... Um, or in fact last year, uh, Shenzhen have now made their entire public transport um, system all EV electric. So there are cities around the world that are doing this, have been doing this for 20 years, and Auckland is somewhat of a late adopter in this story, and we need to get our, our show on the road. Uh, there's a sense of urgency, and, and I suppose uh, that's the, the, the issue here. So it's about integrated planning, long-term planning, but I guess perhaps it'd be challenging. 
let's stop writing plans for 50 years ahead because we may not actually get there. So how about we start writing two-year plans, one-year plans, and, and drive it through that way? Okay. Question from the audience. Um, where are the, can I see the microphones? The, okay, there are microphones. Can I get this man in the middle here who has his hand very high and seems very passionate? So we'll go with him to start with. That's kind of the rule. Look passionate. Hold your hand high. I'm, I can see you. The lights are very blinding here. So this man in the center here. Thank you, sir. If you just want to introduce who you are. Oh, can you turn that mic on? Come over here. We're going to do this manually. <laughs> Hello. How are you? There you go. Yes, my name is Jamie Walton, and um, I first of all want to thank you for the presentations and the great work that you're doing. Um, it's telling to me that the two gentlemen in the Auckland Council don't exactly know what each other are doing. I'm just wondering how <laughs> these... Um, and, and even before we go talking about pr the private sector and <laughs> central government, um, how do we turn these vertical silos horizontal and connect them up into a pipeline that delivers results quickly because we've got lots of alliances. The most We've had alliances in the past about building motorways. The new alliances with the new government seem to be, I've just read them this afternoon, they seem to be about more roads and more sprawl. How do we reverse that? We've got companies, we've got uh, investors just up at Auckland University there who have developed contactless induction charging of electric vehicles, and that they're having to go overseas. We've got uh, just over the hill in Tamaki River, there's a company that wants to build e-ferries, and we have some e-ferries here in Auckland um, quickly, and to, get, to make people proud, how, how can we get some results coming and bridge the, the silos and get them connected up? Thank you so much. I like that. Do you two actually know what each other are doing? Because I think that's yeah, a good, yeah. good question. So that's a fantastic, we could spend the entire rest of this time talking about the answer to that question because there is sort of no clear true answer. Let me just be clear though, Ludo, Ludo and I actually do know who each other does. I was being a little bit tongue in cheek. Um, you know, urban design, sustainability and climate change are um, kind of the same thing. And I would predict that throughout this conversation we both might say things like, um, you know, with the transport and land use situation and, and government, uh, we're given a bit of a leash to say things like, you know, why are we kind of contemning people to a life in a prison, really? Um, and saying, well, you get years of hard labor um, and, um, you know, solitary confinement in enclosed communities because you have to travel in from so far. And it doesn't make sense from a sustainability point of view, from a health point of view, from a climate point of view, um, from, from any point of view. Um, I don't think we're off that song sheet. That's kind of what we're constantly talking about as thought leaders for council as bureaucrats. How to do that goes back to how I answered the previous question though. I mean, admittedly there are silos and we need to work with central government, with EWE, with um, you know, uh, the corporate community, with the community groups on doing that better. And for me to stand here and say we're doing that so well would be stretching the truth. Uh, we need to constantly do this better. We welcome your feedback. But on the climate work, you know, we have signed a formal agreement with government and how we're doing this together in the large span of the zero carbon bill. So, you know, clearly there's a nesting that happens about us as an organization, us as a region, and us as a country that we can do together. And it makes common sense. The devil's sort of in the details. That's my, my quick one. Yeah. Can we take another question? Do you want a quick answer? Oh, look, I mean... Cities all over the world have made decisions because of the silos that, that, that run them. Um, there's an issue, when it's wonderful having Jacqueline here tonight, you know, there is something called uh, elite projection, which is a, a, a new concept which is emerging around the world. It's people in charge tend to be elite, middle class and wealthy. And so we've got to get that diversity at the decision making table, more women, more diversity of ages, ethnicities and different views because solving this is really complex. And so people like John and I, we work horizontally across the organization. You know, that is our mantra. It's about building 
connected conversations around this stuff. So there are many examples. If you think about Wynyard Quarter in Auckland, that did not happen because of one silo. That happened because of a whole range of multidisciplinary public-private partnerships with central government, with the private industry, with not-for-profits. That's how we do the things well. And the best projects are always done together, but the worst ones, building motorways, are usually done in silos. And that has to stop. But it's about leadership from the top all the way through the organization. It's difficult stuff, but it requires leadership and uh, de key decision making. Questions from the audience. I like you because you're here. So, um, this lady here. Hi, my name is Lorraine. My name is Lorraine Knight. Can you hear her? No, we're going to. It's all right. We're getting there. Hi, my name is Lorraine Knight and I live in Onihanga and Onihanga has been turned back into a, the heap it was before. The, the, I understand, um, I found out the other night that um, uh, the East-West Link has been fought for again in the um, Supreme Court and the, you know, I think you've got to look at the vehicles going through. We, my street has been turned into basically a motorway in the last uh, few months and with high pollution, great big trucks, very dangerous, feeding into what will be a East West Link if the National Party have their way. Now, in overseas, you know, a lot of the places are saying, okay, they're only having e-cars and, you know, at least hybrids going into the city and and also, a lot of, a lot of uh, cities are actually looking at how to manage trucks so that you, they haven't got all these polluting trucks everywhere. And, you know, they're not designing for trucks and things uh, that are, are polluting. You know, there's e-trucks and things like that. When are we going to get that? Yeah, that's good. Let's start with that. When are we going to get e-trucks? Go. <laughs> Seems like a good start. I, I, don't want to, I don't want to be the person to answer all these questions, but I think, look, I'd love to hit, talk to you afterwards as well and let's, let's have a conversation because, you know, I'm not a big fan of the East-West Link. You know, it's time that we stop building more roads and build more PT. Auckland is investing $28 billion over the next 10 years as part of a, a program called ATAP, and that was a partnership between central government and ourselves. Uh, most of that, 80% is going into public transport. We are building some roads, but the majority is in inactive travel, which is exciting. Exciting. Um, so, um, you know, we, we are changing and we, the last 50 years we've been building roads. So, it's a, as the Mayor actually mentioned early on tonight, it's about a culture change. And that's really what Shane Ellison and his team have been charged with by his board and by government and by us. So, could we catch up afterwards because I, I, I'm, I'm with you on a lot of that. So, I don't want to take yeah, over the good. conversation. And that sort of ties into some questions that we're getting online. So, okay. let's talk about any hunger. Let's talk about when we talk about Auckland City... What do we mean by Auckland City? Because sometimes I think when we talk about the city, we talk about central city, and Auckland is very broad. But also this great question here um, from Anonymous, um, so I don't know who you are. To what degree is the short government term of three years a handicap to building a sustainable Auckland? And I think it goes to your question there, madam, around what are we doing as projects from a government, and then suddenly government changes and projects don't take a priority. So how much is that a handicap? There you go. Big question. We've got Chris Darby here, one <laughs> of our Darby. senior councillors. Do you want to come up and be a fifth panellist? No, that's, that's <laughs> I do have an answer for that. Too. <laughs> come on, Chris. Everybody, this is Chris Darby. We now have five yeah. panellists. Uh, thank you. Uh, I don't want to uh, crash the party, yourself. folks. Uh, look, uh, this probably came up, uh, Jackie's uh, referring to uh, this question that came up at uh, the conference recently, and I'm a fan. I think there's, we've got to find some fans at central government and, uh, and maybe the opposition who really want to have a crack at looking at a four-year term, because at the moment, you recover from an election, you, you find you're in office, and you know, you you paddle around a little bit, and the second year you govern, and the next third year you're getting ready for an election, and so there's one year of true government governance out of three years. And look, the answer is local government and central government. I think we've got to extend out four years at the moment. Uh, we're not cracking it. There you go. It is affecting us then, yes? And I just acknowledge that another part, I think, of some of the solutions with that is some of the work you're doing at the moment, your climate resilience work, is far extending beyond the term of the government. So it's a combination of how you look at terms, but also having long-term strategies that are bipartisan and enduring. You know, so trying to find consensus, noting there might be a change, and then trying to find a long-term trajectory, which is often the easiest part to agree on, 
often the most challenging aspect is how you get there in the short term. Thank you. Questions from the audience? Hands up high. Let's see if anybody's on this side. No, that lady over there. She is waving. I like waving people. Hello. Hello. Is it working? No. We try again. Aha. Uh -huh. <laughs> I'm Professor Crumdike from Canterbury University, and I just wait, wait, heard. Wait. Is this, did you also apply? To, is, are you the same I, professor? Yes. Are you going to ask the? Because I'm just saying. You, Asking you, my you, question. You're like double medium. No, it's good. I'm going <laughs> to delete your question now. That's well, like, here's my question because <laughs> I, I had to pop my hand up because you just said vision for a change away from the roads and that. So vision, good, good away from the roads, and you're going to build a giant parking lot to import more cars into your city on your waterfront? Just stop. Just say no. Just done. That's all. Drop the mic. I like yes, that. Yes, no, say yes. You can say yes. two questions. Very good. <laughs> it, up until 1945, Auckland had the highest patronage of public transport in the whole world. Okay? You were the number one in the whole world for PT patronage use. And more recently, you're one of the worst in the world. And we are rebuilding at a, at a faster rate than any, many other cities in the world. So our journey is a, is a journey back from the edge of, of really civilization, where we build motorways for 60 years. It's a long time to be addicted to a certain type of mobility. And so what we've got to do is we've got to start thinking about simple things which start to wean us off the motor car. And it's, it's about behavior change. It's not just about projects and it's about incentives, fiscal incentives to change the way we design our city. And so the port is part of a challenging program. The city council, the new super city is not perfect. And there are lots of silos within this organization uh, it's only six years old as a new company. You know, we've got to start to build those bridges. So we're working with the port at the moment to see how we can incorporate those car park buildings as residential buildings into the future because in time they may not be needed. But we're still importing cars and they still need to do the business. So it's really tricky and everything's a system. As Michelle said earlier, it's all linked. So understanding and treating it as a symptom of part of a whole system of things is really important. C could I just quickly chime in and say, Professor Crumdike, it's good to see you again. Um, an excellent question. And, and I, can I just encapsulate what you said and just say, you're kind of show, you're saying, go ahead and, and walk the talk. Um, and I guess adding to what Ludo just said, it's also about guts and decision making. Um, and look, I mean, I don't get to make a ton of decisions. I'm not sitting around the council table. I'm not an executive lead team member. Um, but I do play a role in helping to shape up good decisions. And so if we take the responsibility for saying, that doesn't quite look like the climate resilient, low carbon, zero carbon future that we are trying to deliver, we need to actually take a pretty strong and direct radar to see those massive inconsistencies. And we've got some. Just like as individuals, we all have those inconsistencies between our values and actually how we act every day. We need to do a bit of cl cleaning of the closet there. Um, and that's a great example. Um, but the, you know, the pattern of development is probably the biggest example. You know, if we walk the talk on climate change, we can't be sprawling. Um, we we kind of need to do a bit of a stock take. So thank you. Next question from the audience. Where are my microphones? Um, what, look, there's the lady over there. She is as far away as possible. Let's go with her. <laughs> because we want to see you run. Go. <laughs> She's not playing. <laughs> yes, madam, could you just introduce yourself, please? I didn't really hear the full story there. Do you mind so repeating? So London has in introduced a, what was the? London has a pollution fine. A pollution fine. I like that. That 
is a great question. I'm just going to repeat it for everybody on the live stream at home. Yes, yes. <laughs> Why not? Well, let's do it. Okay, yeah, so let's yeah. talk about the. Let's talk about. So London has introduced their pollution fine, apparently, um, and so can we do that here in Auckland and use the money from it to help subsidise electric vehicles, which we know are pretty much a privilege for many, um, to some of our lower income areas um, where they are having to commute because they're having to live in cheaper housing. I, th I think that kind of contradicts itself here because public transport's already expensive and not affordable. Um, we've had a huge, f you know, regional fuel tax for those low socioeconomic families and like single mums who rely on cars. So how are we going to kind of manage this within this context? Because it's yeah, we can't go one or the other, and it's too expensive to afford an electric vehicle. So we're going to walk everywhere. So how do we, you know what's the kind of transition? How do we get to that ideal where we're incentivising? Because that's so far to reach. Like we're still trying to get on the bus, you know, like baby steps. But this is the reality, you know. So, so Seoul have um, last just recently have introduced free public transport through um, during rush hour. So I think there are lots of things that this organisation, this council, the government could do to to help that process. Absolutely, and um, it's all linked again. Yeah. And, and, you know, with what Gen Zero are trying to push for around free, freeze the fears, like, that could be, uh, I guess, tactical approach around what they might look like. And again, what you're doing within the weekends for under 15s, you know? So there's all these steps trying to get to that ideal. So, yeah. What so let's talk like? about that. Public transport. Why is nobody getting on a bus? Number one, it is no incentive, right? It's expensive, and it's usually cheaper for me to drive my car mm -hmm. than to take a bus, and I have flexibility. So how do we make it more incentivized for people to get on public transport? Winston, all right, we're on to Winston now. Yeah, I look forward to that. Winston Peters, please, can everybody have a gold card? I like this so lady. It is irrefutable, can I just say, it's irrefutable that cost plays a major role in determining what mode someone's gonna take, um, which is why I brought my bike here, because it's the cheapest way of getting around. Um, there's also a range of other things that are really, really fiercely important here and elsewhere in the world. And part of those are things like convenience or safety or frequency. And frequency is often at the top of the list of really, I mean, I'm not going to dispute, cost is huge. We've looked into road pricing. London's doing amazing stuff. We've continued to talk about road pricing. We should continue to talk about road pricing and thinking about those who are going to feel the pain of a, of a policy like that the most and using the money to offset that pain. So I'm totally with you. We also need to think about public transport and frequency. And if we don't, even if it's cheap, people won't get on a bus that comes every hour. You, you should not have to think about when you need to go catch the bus. You should just instinctively go there. John's points are absolutely right. I, I just, the trouble with, I don't want to sound defensive, okay, and I, I hope I'm not. Um, there are things that this organization does and the council does and Auckland does which I, I fight and I'm anti. But one of the things we've done best is the new bus um, rollout of the new bus network. It is fantastic. It was a nightmare before. It is the fastest growing element of our transport system today. Um, it is much more easy, much more convenient. And all those things that John said are absolutely need to be in place. The, the issue is, is getting people to try it and to start to, once you've tried and once you start to buy, but two weeks free public transport for those that don't currently use buses and let them start to see how that feels because the system's brilliant and it's only just beginning. So I don't want to just, I don't want to champion the good stuff just because it is really good. It was awful before and we're going through this rebuilding process. So, you know, I don't want to criticize when it's not, not, not due. No, I like that. Um, John, though, I thought I liked you, but don't give me your cyclist thing. Like, it's great that you cycled here, and that is a privileged position to be in. Number one, you can afford a bicycle, and yeah. number two, you live close enough that That's right. you can cycle. And we're That's talking right. about people. Auckland is a big place, and I don't think yeah. cycling is always... Is, uh, brave yeah. enough. Brave enough. Yes, that lady there. And so it's brave. great that you can get on your bike, but I'm not sure it's a solution for all people, um, unless you can get Go, all your kids and your family and your cats. Right a reply? Break. Write a reply. Can I, can I, can I just jump totally in come a back. Bit? Yeah, this is um, I take your point. It's a very good point. It's a very good point. And in fact, yes, I will agree with you. I'm in a privileged position where I live very close and I could just ride my bike in. 
Yeah, and, and able-bodied. able-bodied. If you go, so I've been to a bunch of cities, as many of us have. Um, you know, a lot of them tend to be in Scandinavia that we talk about. But when you look at um, the average age on a bike or the average gender in some of these city- cities, it's actually kind of remarkable that you will find people almost into 100 years actually on a bike because it's safe, it's convenient, people also aren't going far. So I think the point we were trying to make earlier is actually the design of our city, if you fast forward 50, 60, 70 years, if we set up a city where you don't have to bike in 20 kilometers, you could actually just take your bike to go across like you know, a kilometer, or you can actually just go down the street. Um, that's the kind of city that I have in my mind that is actually accessible to many more people, and, and, and people across the age, gender, background uh, spectrum. Um, so, so yes, I agree. Right now, it doesn't work for everybody, and it can't the way it works, so let's change it. Thank you. I am still your friend, though. Thank you. Um, can we ask this lady there? She's got some blonde hair. She has a hand held high, and she looks very happy, and I'm hoping so she's going to ask us a big question with a working microphone. Yes. Hello. My name's Hannah. <laughs> Hi, Ludo. <laughs> um, I'm studying geography at UOA. I'm in my final semester, and my question today is, how do we solve the disconnect in our city? Um, I think one of the big issues, I used to live in London, I think one of the biggest issues in Auckland is how suburbs are so difficult to get between. Yes, like it's great. I live on, I I live just off Dominion Road and it's so easy to get in and out of the city, but it's so difficult to get to other parts of the city. And as I don't own a car, I usually have to rely on other people to get me to other places or Ubers, which is very expensive sometimes, just to get home safe or just to get to another part of the city, um, like how is that going to be solved? Like it shouldn't, I shouldn't have to travel into the city for half an hour to then go out again to another part. I think what I think should happen is Auckland needs more hubs. It can't just be focused in the CBD anymore. Great question. How do we connect our suburbs to each other, not just the city center? Anybody want to take that on? Anybody? <laughs> I want to, but I, again, it's about the rest of the team here. I, I, there's so many answers around these questions that, you know, there, there's, a pro, there's a program in place. Uh, it's not perfect. It's been underinvested for 50 years. So that's my first point. The second point is City Rail Link is not about the city centre or the CBD, as we used to call it. So Michelle's absolutely right. The City Rail Link will double the efficiency of the entire rail network. You'll be able to get in from Manukau, which currently takes over an hour, within 20 minutes. It changes the way we think and where we think about our city. Light rail is then the next part of the layer of the transport system, which, again, Michelle mentioned earlier. We don't have it. We used to have it. And we're now about to build the first line, for the, which is the first time in 50 years. It was ripped up by the government in 56. So we're a long way back from where we need to be. And that will cost money. And so it's really thinking about how this whole thing links. Um, Panuku are working across the region, Manukau, Onehunga, Northcote, building these regional, sub-regional centers, putting these parts of the foundations in place for a city which starts to be more sustainable. And I guess maybe my question, maybe back to Davina here, is perhaps to bring her into this, is, you know, what is the role of the private sector in, in, in making this happen? Because at the end of the day, the government doesn't have enough money you guys have money, you've got investors, you've got people. We need to work in partnership with you, and what's your role in that? Do you mind if I sort of, yeah? Where we've seen this done well internationally, there's a concept of what you call value capture, yeah. where, where there's higher investment from, you know, government or, you know, um, council, whichever form of government it is, and that's matched by higher development fees in whatever form as a form of value capture because those properties will have higher value because people want to live in livable, walkable locations that are connected to transport. So if we look at some of the international examples, we see that's been done really well in Hong Kong and there's some connected links in Singapore. I don't claim to have the answer, you know, in its entirety, but noting that, you know, often the the most successful elements of this have become in tripartite um, partnerships where there's been an investment from another source to boost the kind of radical change that you need to see. And there's a number of international models. And, you know, whilst Auckland's on its journey, it's good to see that you're looking at how you can accelerate those with different kinds of partnerships. 
Great, so that's exactly the, the way in which we're going to pay for these things because we just don't, we're not a wealthy country and we need the private sector, we need their intelligence, their innovation and their money to partner with us. So uh, the light rail project, that's a pu perfect public-private partnership, um, worth a lot to the people that along the corridor but worth a lot to the investor who invests in your company. Yes. Could, I, could I add a very short phrase and just say, I've said this before in forums like this, so apologies for repeat customers. Um, let's stop doing the dumb things, you know, because they cost money too. And if we stop doing the dumb things, we'd have money to do the better things. I like that. Can you write me a dumb things list and then we can just yeah. call people out? That would be great. Okay. Uh, question. We haven't gone over that side of the room. That lady there, she is waving. She knows the rules now. Let's go there. Hi there. Um, just talking about doing the dumb things and public-private partnerships. I'm the design strategist at Spark Arena. And since last year, we've, um, well, um, we have to serve drinks to people. They come to concerts, they like a beer. Um, because of the health and safety, we can't give you a glass. So we serve you a disposable um, single-use cup. And since last year, all of our cups have been made of cornstarch and they are composted and we make sure that they go to the correct place and are composted. Um, that represents a million cups a year and we've saved um, from our projections over 55 tons going to landfill in the last six months. Um, we did this because we think it's the right thing to do. Um, because we live in this city, we're humans and we think we should turn the tap off and not just mop the overflowing bath. Um, We've taken a lead very publicly. We've had a lot of people come to the building since we've done it. And we haven't had any buy-in from any public organization. I've tried to be in touch with the Ministry of the Environment, who fobbed me off telling me I could sign up to some stupid thing that would give me a logo. Nobody is interested in what we're physically doing on the ground. And this is, you, you're talking grand schemes, 10 years, 20 years. And Ludo nailed it when he said, you know, we should be finding results in two years. We've had results within weeks of what we've done. And I went down to the Auckland Arts Festival and I was given a polystyrene cup. Shame on you, Auckland Council. Yes, that lady. I don't, I don't think we need to come back from that. I think she's made her point. I don't, I don't wanna hear from the panelists. They have nothing better to say than that lady there. Okay, next question. <laughs> this, this young man here. Uh, hello, everyone. Is that working? Yeah. yeah. Uh, my name is Fred. Um, I'm, from, I'm from Melbourne originally, and Hi, I'm Fred. studying here in Auckland, studying urban planning. I was very pri privileged to be part of John's team recently. Um, my question is about... I live in Onehunga now, and Panuku is doing uh, some redevelopment there. And I, when I go to the shops in the evening, I see a lot of diverse range of people in Onehunga, and I love that about Onehunga, and it's great. Um, but how do we bring these people along in terms of the plans for um, Only Hunger and how do we engage with a broad spectrum of people outside of the uh, bubble? And I think everyone knows what I mean when I say the bubble. Cool. Jacqueline. Um, yeah, kia ora. Did the Only Hunger like, community round up and all come together? <laughs> um, no, that's, such a, that's a great question because, um, you know, you guys have the 312 hub, you know, focus around young people there, and I know the team from Panaku are here as well. Um, and, and so they're doing some awesome stuff around uh, changing, I guess, some of these social procurement investment in terms of young people, how they're employing them, um, and doing some really placemaking based stuff. It's just... I guess tapping into those existing networks that are there and ensuring that you're changing the way we communicate in terms of council and those in the community. But I think they're doing some great stuff out there, um, and, but that's come from the community there. So maybe you need to, yeah, he, have you been involved in the 312? No. Oh, there you go. We'll send you an invite, <laughs> get you there. Because, it, you know, that's a great community. Um, and yeah, it would be awesome for you to connect with the uh, team back over there, Nico, uh, from Panaku. So kia ora. No. no. One last question. <laughs> this Shut lady down. here who has been patiently waiting, and I'm afraid that is going to be our last question of the evening. So we have run out of time. Uh, I'm a grandmother, very concerned about my ch grandchildren's future. Um, I've spent a reasonable amount of time in Holland, and their public transport is free for all students, university students. I went 
with a young friend who was at university some years ago, I got a 40% discount just because I was traveling with her. Now, I'm not saying that's okay, but... I like this, I bring a friend on the bus and you get a by discount. The, by the time those kids get yeah. to the age where they have to start paying, and that's once they've finished their university degrees or their training, they have already mm -hmm. got a very well-established habit of using public transport. Yeah, I like that. So basically... <laughs> I'm with you. And I guess it's a, it goes back to affordability, right? Is that what it is? Is, is it a money discussion? Could I just put out an idea that might get me fired? Um, what if everybody who makes decisions about public transport use or uh, use council level actually committed to taking public transport yeah. at least once a week, you know, to actually see what, the, what, con what constraints there are, how difficult it is. I mean, look, we're all trying to move the ball in the same direction here, but I think actual lived experience of what the challenges are would, would really dramatically change how you make those decisions. And better yet, if those people making decisions, right back to democracy, if they represented Auckland a bit better, with due respect to, to Chris Darby, who is an absolute champion in this space, Pippa Coombe, who is as well, but they need a little bit of backup from, from the rest of the community with age diversity, gender diversity, ethnicity diversity. And if those people are taking public transport too, We'll be making much better decisions. We'll get to Holland. I like that, John. John, look, I'm a doer, not a talker. So I, what I need from you is a list of people that we can stalk. That would be great. Um, and we can see how they get to work if they're making public transport decisions. And then we can have some bigger conversations with them. Do you like that? Should we do that? That would be quite fun. Hey. Um, I'm afraid we are out of time, because I think we could have this conversation all day. Ladies and gentlemen, please, will you thank Davina Rooney, John Moreau, Jacqueline Paul, and Ludo Campbell-Reed for us. Thank you so much. tonight, I would like to introduce Andrew Eagle, CEO NG, NZGBC, to the stage to say our farewells and close the ceremony. And I am out of here. Thank you so much for coming out. Andrew, where are you? There he is. Salam. Ina mana, ina reo, ira rangatira ma. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, katoa. Well, thanks a lot. Uh, you know, that's a hard act to follow. Some um, really great speakers. And uh, I have to say thank you to them and thank you to the great uh, emceeing. Uh, but also thanks to you guys for some really great points and engaging and pushing them a bit. You know, we like to keep them busy and on their toes. But also a really big thank you to uh, Auckland Council for having the forethought to create this dialogue and discussion because the more we shout about it, the more change we're going to get. And uh, people are watching and people listen to this and, and people have taken away a lot from, from today. So I'm just going to touch on some of the things that I heard and I um, really appreciate any, anybody chipping in and, and responding to that also. I thought there were some really powerful messages there from Davina about how businesses stand to benefit from uh, making change, energy efficiency and climate resilience. So resilient buildings need mean lower insurance costs, but more importantly, perhaps, resilient buildings and other structures like that infrastructure means a more resilient community, and isn't that so important for New Zealand? I really love the term elite projection, and I love the fact that we got immediately a response from Jacqueline about how we can get young people in, involved um, immediately and a connection there with, with Frank and the, and the audience. I love Ludo's term about the house being on fire. If you don't uh, follow Ludo and listen to him, he really senses that, right? And he's, he's driving that change. So, uh, you know, I know there's more change to be had, but the foresight to be talking about Queen Street being pedestrianised, that's a major step. People are going to see that, it's going to happen, uh, and that's going to lead to other change. I like uh, Jamie's point from the audience, right? Are you two talking to each other? <laughs> I quite like that. And I, I'm going to um, come back to this point because people who we heard today, you know, they're being brave and they're putting ideas out there that do actually challenge. But it is true that not all the time the people in those senior positions in Auckland Council are going to listen to them. So there's a challenge to you when you see exciting things that John Motto is doing, like his sustainability action plan, which is looking at low carbon future, better public transport, these sorts of actions that you get online and, and you support that and you drive for change and you push senior people to support that uh, because he needs, he needs that energy and support as well. 
even if he does, you know, cycle short distances as an able-bodied person. Probably, probably while smiling. <laughs> Gee, so annoying. Um, and, and so I think we do need to keep challenging, right? I really like the point about the um, about the um, the car the car yard that we're going to have on our beautiful foreshore. You know, isn't that ridiculous? Isn't Stop doing dumb things. It's a, there's a catchphrase here for tonight. Um, so I, I really like that. So there was a really clear message from, from tonight. Um, and, you know, that is that we need to get transport right here. And that's going to lead to people feeling more connected. It's going to lead to people getting around more easily, but people feeling more safe. And I really like some of the key messages here from the geography student about just wanting to make it easier to get around. And I think that is key. We, need, we heard about more hubs. We know that Panuku Development Auckland is doing some great work here. Um, but we really heard that people want change. I like Ludo's points that you know, we are working away at 50 or 60 years of poor investment, poor infrastructure around us. I do believe change is coming. Here's the rub. Here's the rub. In this whole thing, we need to celebrate the small steps forward we're making. Chris Darby's here and others because that's the thing that gives us energy to go ahead and do more change. And it doesn't take away from the fact that we still need to get angry about the pace of change. So we can say it's tremendous that Auckland Council has doubled uh, use of public transport in, in a very short space of, of time, the electrification of the trains, more stops, more frequency, I agree, more buses. But at the same time, we can say, bloody hell, let's do this fourfold faster and, and fourfold more, I agree. And, uh, you know, a really great point from Davina, um, a great collaborator from Australia who I'm just really honoured to have over here. So um, there we are. We take development contributions from people for new developments. And I kind of question what we're talking about. Could we not be saying those developments where those developers put in more public transport, where they have better resilience to climate change, why can't we dramatically reduce the development contributions or make a difference between those that are uh, more impactful and, and less. You know, think about how we're engaging more with, with iwi and reward that, have more resilient um, communities that are being developed. So, so that's some of what I heard. I, I know it's not everything. I, I do think that a really big collaborator and potentially a, a group of people to help drive that change, because you need our support for this, is the Climate Leaders Coalition. Some of New Zealand's uh, biggest brands have signed up to getting to measuring and reducing their carbon emissions, and they're going to be on board with this. They equate to over 50% of all of our carbon emissions in New Zealand. Hell, let's get them involved. I just thought I'd finish with a, with a story uh, which is about Auckland Council and something I, I think is kind of uplifting and, and positive. So six years ago, you know, we were asked to create a, a tool to look at resilient, low-carbon homes that... Um, that deliver savings and are healthier for New Zealanders. And it's worth noting that our building code is absolutely woeful by international standards. And we created that, and an organisation stepped forward about two and a half years ago and said, we believe in this, and that was Panuku Development Auckland. And I'm telling it partly to celebrate that. Um, they also took up Green Star Communities, a great tool that Davina was involved in in, in Australia. That drives forward livable, resilient communities uh, and it focuses on engagement from local stakeholders like iwi to get communities we all deserve. So they're leading in New Zealand on these things, and we should be proud of that. But here's the really interesting thing. So they're doing 9,000 homes to Homestar. Some other organisations are doing that as well because they led. And as a result, as a result, we're now working with central government to change the building code. And that's going to mean um, more insulation. It's going to be warmer homes. Less, uh, about 80% less construction waste to landfill, another change because they were willing to step up and deliver for Aucklanders. So um, I, I think there's just a little note there about some action taking place and some people out there who are brave enough to, to step forward and, and I wanted to reflect on that. Right, so uh, I'm going to ask you to do something now, your key action. I'd like you to stand up. So we've got a hell of a way to go to get to zero carbon, you know, but New Zealand can do that. We were the first nation in the world to give women the vote, one of the first to give uh, 
uh, enable gay, gay marriage, and, and we can lead, and I, I firmly believe that. But to do that, we need you, and we need you to keep giving John and Ludo some stick, but we also need you to give them energy and give your colleagues energy, give your neighbours energy when they're taking the right steps. So what I'm going to ask you to do is to raise your right hand. Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to ask you to repeat after me. I believe in a better future. I believe in zero carbon. I believe we can do this. Awesome. Now I want you to turn to your neighbor, right? Turn to your neighbor. Keep your hands up. <laughs> Not all one person. Do a high five. Wait for me. Wait for me. Do a high five. Let's say, let's get this shit done. <laughs> Kia ora. Let's go. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.